Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Thanks for joining us. Today I have with me Tanya Romanoff, who is the author of Mother Tongue, the saga of three generations of Balkan women. She's also the author of 100 Years of Exile, In Search of My Father's Russia. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you, Becky. It's an honor to be here. Today, we're going to focus on the book Mother Tongue, the saga of three generations of Balkan women. Tanya, could you tell us a little bit about this book and what inspired you to write it? Yes, I'd be happy to. I um, come from a a series of very strong women. And as I look back at what my mother and my grandmother had gone through, I just thought it was really important to share it. And um, they were uh, both exiled multiple times from their countries. And over time, as we are now dealing with exile and refugees, their stories have just become that much more important. So I, I'm just uh, thrilled that I had the opportunity to share their story. And it's written as a creative nonfiction book so that you're not pulled deep into boring history. You're pulled into their lives and into their story. Yeah, that's great. I certainly found it fascinating and, and learned a lot that I had no clue about uh, in the Balkan region. So who do you feel is your target audience for this audio book? You know, who are those listeners that you feel might most benefit from it or enjoy it? Right. Well, you know, I used to have a pretty broad range, but there's a new group that's joined um, that's really exciting, which is anybody traveling in that part of the world. Uh, And that's one of the things that I've learned that I didn't expect. Uh, So the Balkans seem very remote to people and very unknown. And yet I walked with a friend from San Francisco to Sausalito not too long ago, and we took a ferry boat uh, back. And the length of the ride of that ferry boat is how long it takes to get from my mother's hometown to Venice, Italy. So, in fact, it's really not all that remote. And Croatia and its coastline have become very popular for people who are uh, doing tours of, of the coastline and of the islands. And they often enter a world that they know nothing about. So they're talking about Croatia, they're talking about Serbia, they're talking about Montenegro. It could be another world. And what I've, what I've been told by so many people now is that when they read this book about life in the Balkans and history in the Balkans, suddenly it all makes a lot more sense. That's great. Um, I, I want to, uh, one of the things that I, one of the things that I really enjoyed about this book and that was a bit surprising to me that I would like to ask you about, and we can cut this part out of the interview if it feels like a spoiler. So just that as a side note is how when you talk about mother tongue or when you use that title, that mother tongue meant something, means something so much more to you particularly than the average person might think of it. Right, right. No, that's a really good point. Um, a mother tongue is the language you spoke with your mother or your father often, or it could be the language of the country you were born in or the country you grew up in. Interestingly enough, for me, I was born in Yugoslavia, but I was six months old when I left. Um, I certainly did not speak my mother's tongue at that time. Uh, And interestingly enough, you can hear from my voice that I speak American with no accent, but English was my third language because my father is actually Russian. So I grew up in a community that spoke Russian at home and at Russian school. American or English at my other school. And I grew up in a world where only one person spoke my mother's language, and that was my mother. 
So it's a very unique notion of what a mother tongue might be. I've never heard of anyone else who spoke a language with only one person. Yeah. I won't ask you to tell us about that part of the book because I think it's actually when you discovered that for yourself is really an exciting moment in the book. I don't want to spoil it. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) I do want to ask, you know, for you, if you had to select a favorite part of the audio book, is there is there a part that you would pick out that would not be a spoiler for your listeners that you'd like to share? <laughs> um, oh my God, I have so many. You know, I, I do kind of like um, chapter 22, which is where I actually start talking. And um, it takes place in a refugee camp, which is where I grew up. Um, And it's actually a situation where my mother is being criticized for trying to speak to me in a language that no one else is using. So it's it's interesting that you asked that question. And then I came up with this chapter. Maybe it's coincidental, uh, (laughs) but it is a favorite. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Your life has, um, it's so so fascinating. I uh, feel honored to have been able to be a part of bringing your audiobook to life and and engage with you and with your life story. And what would you say at this point are you feeling is your biggest goal with your book and audiobook? Um, well, I really wanted to be reaching a broad audience. I have gotten so many positive uh, notes from people who read the book, who go on my website and send messages. Um, I, I'm just so honored with how deeply it touches people. And this whole issue of immigration, um, it's something that's not even in my book, but um, a friend of mine recently was raising funds to help Syrian refugees on a Greek island. Uh, and I went online to look into that. And I discovered an island called Lemnos which was right next to the island that she was on called Lesbos. And when I looked at the pictures, I finally realized that I was looking at pictures taken a hundred years ago when my father was a child and a refugee on that island uh, when he was fleeing the communists in Russia in 1920. And so to realize, yeah, that a hundred years later, we haven't learned anything. We haven't changed anything. It's still a refugee camp. It's just a story that resonates so deeply. Yeah. Uh, And this, this, uh, I want to follow up and reiterate with uh, what you're saying about the whole um, immigration and the situation with refugees. And this is certainly something that so many people are facing challenges with. And I would love to hear what you have to say about how this experience and some of these these experiences that you had and that you talk about in this book that others from other parts of the world, other cultures that are also in an immigration, emigration, refugee kind of situation would find uh, that they would relate to that. No, no, that's a hard one. Um, I, I will just say that there are so many refugees in our country. And if you look at my background, the success that I've had uh, is incredible, coming from basically nowhere and starting with nothing. And it's become harder, but I hope the opportunity is still there for people. And I hope just seeing examples um, of that happening might inspire people as they're going through some really challenging times. Yeah. Let's pause for a moment. We'll be right back. Here at Pro Audio Voices, we love working with authors who have a big goal in mind. They really want to reach out to their audience around the world. We're here to help make that happen. It starts with our pre-production process, where we're evaluating and determining what elements of the audiobook we can leverage to both create an excellent listener experience for your listeners as well as drawing them to your website to engage with you further. It continues on through the production process, making decisions that will enhance and support your big goals, as well as creating a great listener experience. But we don't stop there. 
Once the audiobook is live, we move on to helping you market your audiobook with the Audiobook Marketing Program. Come check us out at ProAudioVoices.com. To schedule a call to talk about your audiobook project, click on Get Started. Is there somebody that you would point to in terms of your the, the coming through these many challenges in the refugee, growing up in the refugee camp, having, you know, being forced to move from one area to another, losing track of uh, parts of the family and um, parts of the family being on different sides of political boundaries. What would you, can you point to something that you feel like provided a core of strength in all of that? (laughs) That's very interesting that you should ask that because um, you, know, you know I've done a number of readings and people keep asking questions that surprise me. At one of my most recent readings, somebody said, well, so you talk about the fact that your father worried about you all the time, which he did. My father was convinced that he had been a refugee as a child. He had been a refugee as an adult. We were going to be refugees again. It was a temporary asylum we had here. And so they said to me, did you grow up frightened? And I said, thought about it. And I said, no, I didn't grow up frightened. I grew up pissed. I grew up angry. And and what's interesting is we went from that to saying I grew up a badass, uh, which turns out today is not a negative. <laughs> Most people think it's a positive. But it made me tough. It made me so tough, which if you think about Being a woman who became a business executive in the 1970s, that's what it took. And um, so I will say, you know, you can't predict what your reactions to life are going to be. But sometimes out of, you know, some very challenging circumstances come the characteristics that make the difference for you. Yeah. So I don't know if you can uh, are able to sort of take your mind back to before we got started with the audiobook. And do you remember what was your biggest challenge in regards to that whole process in the beginning before you started? Well, you know, in terms of, of having the audiobook done and created. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Um, first of all, I, I don't even know if I told you why I went on that challenge. Um, I was talking to my daughter-in-law about the book, and I said, you know, I really want the grandkids to read it. And she said, you know, it's much more likely that Baker will listen to your book than read it. And that was my 13-year-old grandson. And I said, of course, that's true for the whole young generation. And by the way, a lot of people have already read the book, uh, listened to the audio book. And then I decided I would try and do it myself. And um, so, in fact, I think I called you and asked you for advice on that. And when you finished explaining to me how I would have to learn how to breathe or not breathe, and (laughs) that it would be probably more complicated uh, and more expensive to do that than to have you do it for me, I got started on the final path, which was working with you. And then, of course, what we have is a book that is embedded with expressions in Serbian and Croatian and Russian. And I needed someone who could learn quickly. And so that was really fun. And it was really fun listening to you start with very little experiences, I would guess, in Serbian and ending up sounding like a pro. Oh, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I've had so many people say to me, wow. She sounds like she really knows that language. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. If you um, if you had a piece, one piece of advice for authors that are in a similar situation to your own before you got started in this uh, the process of the audiobook, what what might that be? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I would definitely always recommend doing an audiobook. I um, I think having the excerpts on your web page is important and having it easily accessible or having the excerpts available on Amazon's web page or whatever web page the audio people are going to find it at. I, I just think that's so invaluable because it makes the book feel more personal. Um, So I'd say that's important. Um, I kind of like the idea of launching it a little later. Um, So, you know, in retrospect, I suspect I might launch a book first and then 
ebook and then an audio book or you know some other order. But I I actually like the idea of having a small gap uh, between the launches. Yeah, yeah, nice. So uh, you had a publisher for your print book, and could you tell us how that worked out? With did they also handle the audio book, or or uh, how did that work out for you? Right. No, I have a publisher. It's Traveler's Tales, and they published a well-known series of uh, travel, successful travel writing stories. But they do not publish uh, audiobooks, and so it works very well in conjunction. You know, they manage the print, um, and um, I manage the audio. And in fact, Becky manages it for me. Yeah, great. So, so right. many different, so many different um, pieces of the culture clash and culture integration questions in this book. Fascinating. Right. No, there are a lot of them. And yeah, language is a funny one. And I'll just share another story. And I, it might be in the book. I think it is. I, I remember drive, uh, going downtown in a bus with my mother because we were shopping and um, she practiced the whole way down how she was going to ask for bedding. And she walked into the uh, store right up to the department, the bedding department, and asked for the ships. <laughs> <laughs> she got the sheets and the ships confused after half an hour of practicing. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, language can be tricky. <laughs> Especially yes. English language. Yes. <laughs> And I will point out, too, by the way, that I am now working on my next book. I'm really excited about it. I'm in the middle of a book about my father's family background. As I've mentioned before, he was a refugee from the Russian Revolution. I think it's going to be called 100 Years of Exile. Excellent. Glad to hear that. Yeah. 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 (laughs) We might have more opportunities coming up soon. We may. Great. Well, let's um, let's listen to a sample of Mother Tongue, a saga of three generations of Balkan women by Tanya Romanoff, narrated by Becky Parker, that's me, and produced by Pro Audio Voices. This is now available as an audiobook as well as in print. Of course I can find the home I was born in, Mama exclaimed in response to his question. Climbing a hill that rose sharply from the Adriatic Sea, We three seekers wandered, lost, on rough roads past ancient stone houses in the nearly deserted village of Croatia. One of the pilgrims, Zora, my seventy-year-old widowed mother, was in a town she had left as an infant. She was searching for the home she was born in, for the house in which she believed her uncle still lived. I walked with her, able to communicate with the people, for Mama had always insisted that her language was my birthright and would not be lost to me. My American husband, Harold, the third pilgrim, spoke only English, but was first to understand the challenges of our situation. Well, where is your house then, Zora? he asked. It is near here. I am sure of that. I just need to look a little longer, Harold. Zora. We've walked up and down every road in this village. I know, she interrupted, but I can see it in my mind as clearly as if it were yesterday. Okay, okay, I give up. Harold smiled and put his arm around her. If you aren't tired, we can keep going. Mama looked at my tall husband with a bemused expression. She always insisted her height was five feet and a half. That half was only half an inch, but Zora was anybody's equal. English was her third or fourth language, depending on how much of a language you needed to know to count it. She spoke it well, but with a Slavic accent. He was blonde, blue-eyed, six feet six inches tall, without shoes. English was his first and only language. He didn't really know where in Germany his family had come from, or when. It had never seemed important. Personally, I was afraid we were at an impasse. I knew that in Mama's mind, the house of her birth was a sacrosanct memory. I knew because it had been featured in so many of the stories she had told me of her life and her childhood. 
I felt that I could almost find that home myself. But this was her search for her past, and nothing was gelling. I was staying out of this phase of the discussion. Harold knew how to avoid pushing the buttons that I always seemed to land on. Ours was a mother-daughter friction developed over the stresses of a lifetime, while theirs was a uniquely close relationship for a man and his mother-in-law. This trip represented an important turning point in our lives. Zora had been struggling since the death of my father a few years earlier. Diminished and listless, her step had lost its bounce, her eyes their challenge. She rarely went out and didn't want to venture far when she did. Then, unexpectedly, she decided it was time to reconnect with her family home. "'Tis nash Tanya," she said to me. Ne mojimo vija chekiti. You know, Tanya, we can't wait forever for this war to end. That sentence of Zora's was a key milestone, and Harold and I quickly moved to support her desire. Unfortunately, Zora's personal struggles had come neither at the beginning nor the end of the problems for her troubled Balkan homeland. At the time of our visit, in 1992, the Balkans were once again at war. It seemed this one would destroy the country of Yugoslavia for good. A few months earlier, Harold and I had been sitting in the kitchen where I had spent my childhood. Mama served her personal version of Dobosh Torta. Thanks again for joining us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.